I'm going to record this. If you don't want to, oh, there we go. If you don't want to be recorded on camera or whatever, that's fine. This is only going back to you. So you have a copy of this so you can reflect back on some of the information that's told. Um, if you're anything like me, I'm not a big note taker. In fact, just about everything about this class I already had stored up here, but I looked at this piece of paper and I said, well, I have nothing written on paper and I'm not a PowerPoint guy. And so I had to write some things on paper so we have some direction. So the first thing I want to start with is I want to talk a little bit about the statistics in the state of Tennessee and the uh, county of Williamson and Davidson. Um, I know a lot of you are in the Williamson County area. Leslie, I know you're Wilson County, um, some are in Davidson County, but I want to talk about some of the stats as far as the VA home buyer is concerned. So in 2022, the Williamson County, uh, Williamson County rate ranked 390th in the nation. Okay, so I want you to think of how big our nation is and how many different counties. Just in Tennessee alone, there's 99 counties. So for Williamson County to be ranked 390th in the nation takes this big scope that we have and makes Williamson County bigger, right? That means that we have a lot of veterans that have either returned home and they're buying homes. By the way, buying homes in a market where homes are not cheap right, which demonstrates that a lot of veterans or active duty service member have come back and decided that they're going to purchase a home that's in a higher price line than some average people can typically afford, okay? Davidson County, 198th in the nation. That's massive. That means Nashville, Tennessee, a lot of people are coming back to Nashville or they're coming to Nashville and they're purchasing homes. Once again, point to a cheap home in Nashville, Tennessee. In fact, the average loan size was 345227 Who in here would hate to have an extra $345,000 loan in their pipeline right now that's almost guaranteed to close? Anybody? I didn't think that would be the case. In fact, we'd all take it. Uh, in the state of Tennessee in 2022, there was $4 billion in VA purchase business. $4 billion with a B in VA purchase business. Okay. Now we move to a quarter. We're looking at 2023. By the way, 2022, like we talked about, the first six months was very compressed on who could buy, right? Your conventional buyers, over asking price. If you walked in with a loan that stood for some sort of acronym, you were automatically pushed out the door. It was actually sickening to see it. We went to bat for a lot of different people. I remember specifically having one client. She was putting $300,000 down on a $600,000 home. The, the son-in-law for the sellers is a well-known mortgage loan officer in our area, and he denied it because he said that the person didn't, they had too many ways out. They wanted a $40,000 non-refundable deposit in order to accept the offer. It would not be in that person's best interest. By the way, the person that was buying is an active NCIS agent for the Navy, right? She's going to do what she said. She's putting $300,000 down. So I bring that up to tell you that 2022's numbers are very skewed because there was such a large period where people didn't have the opportunity to buy. And then we move to 2023. And 2023 is what? For lack of better terms, listen, if you have kids near when I say this, please plug their ears. 2023 has been a shit show, to say the least, right? It's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare. Rates continue to rise. And by the way, we think of investors, and in most markets, investors provide veterans better rates than they do all other programs. Why? Because they perform better. They're one of the top performing loans out of conventional FHA, every other loan product out there. They're the top performing loan. But yet, they're also the easiest to refinance. So investors are looking, if I put this money out there, it's not going to mature. And so if it doesn't mature, I'm going to lose money. Why would I put the money out there without a cost? And so when we look at today's interest rates with VA home loans, they tend to even cost a little more or be comparable to conventional rates. But in fact, in the past, it was opposite. If you were a VA home loan buyer, if conventional buyers had a 3.125, you had a 2.75. If conventional buyers had a five, you had a four and a half. In today's market, if conventional buyers have a seven and a half, so do you. Okay. And that's by nature of investors putting their money out on the line and saying, I will finance this. I am not going to get a return because I don't get a return. I need to charge more up front to make this worth it, collect margin up front because the refinance opportunities for individuals is too great. But that also works in our advantage. We talk about the resiliency of a VA home buyer. The advantage is, and many people have said this in this room, what do you do? You, you marry the house, you date the rate. It's very easy for a veteran to break up with the rate and find a new rate, right? It's like they were single all along. They were never married to the house. They just find a new rate. It's very easy. And so because it's so easy, 
investors say, well, six months, 210 days pass. These people can go from seven to six and a half like that, and I'll lose all my money. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, in order for a mortgage company to make money off a deal, it has to mature for about three years. Okay, just so happens that the average loan time, the average time that somebody stays in a home or a certain loan is three to five years. So think about that. Rates drop a half. People are running to the bank, give me that half a percent lower rate. They drop another half. This thing starts to flip over and over and over and over again, right? If rates go down next, next year, like everybody talked about, they will, just like they did this year. But if they do go down, people are going to run. They're going to save that half a percent. A half a percent is a lot of money on a half million dollars, okay? But because of that, investors have to be protective of their money, if not the loose, all right? So that's the reason why we're seeing that change. Let me let Carol back in. She, she jumped out for a second. So let's talk about the 2023 Q2 numbers. Q2 is closed. We can talk about the actual factual numbers. By the way, if you have any questions about the validity of these numbers or where they came from, they came from the lender reports on the va.gov website. You can go verify these numbers yourself. And the reason why that's important is because somebody may challenge you and say, well, where'd you find those numbers? You have a friend, his or her or it, I don't know what it is. Name is Google. You can literally put in VA home loan numbers and it will populate these numbers by quarter, by county, by state, okay? So Q2 2023, 1,991 VA home loans in that quarter, in that quarter, because it, re it reports per quarter and then per whole calendar year. Average purchase price, 339,983. Went down just a hair from the previous year. Why? Probably because the market's starting to level out a little bit, right? Six hundred and seventy-six hundred thousand or hundred million dollars worth of volume this year. Six hundred and seventy-six hundred million. It's a hard number to say, right? It'd be even harder to count that many dollars. But what I'm getting at here is the volume is still there. The volume is still there. Remember Pareto's law, the 80-20 law. Who knows what that is? Raise your hand if you know what the 80-20 law is. I only have two faces on here, so I only have two hands that could be raised. Here's the thing, 80-20. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. So imagine if 20% of the people got a hold of $676 million and divided that amongst 20% of the people that actually did the work. And each of you see it in your market. You see it in your market centers. You see it in your real estate company. You walk in, there's a thousand people in there. And of the thousand, maybe if you're lucky or if the broker is lucky, 200 are actually producers. The other 800 are talking about the second job they may need to do or something like that, which is okay. But realistically, we're in a market where if we do the job that we do correctly, properly with the right intent, we are gonna make the money. That is why all of you are here, okay? This is a word that's been passed around like crazy. Market changes, everybody gets creative and you should, but I wanna caution you on one thing. The word assumptions, we've all heard of it. And we've all heard of it from different levels. We should do an assumption, we should not do an assumption. Everybody does an assumption, list assumption on the, the MLS, whatever it may be, we're all doing assumptions. The fact of the matter is not every loan can do an assumption. Every VA loan is a summable, just like every FHA loan is assumable. It doesn't mean that the lender has to allow it to happen. The VA does not have a law in place that forces the lender to make an assumption happen, okay? And here's why. Leslie, you're a veteran. Sarah shows up and says, Leslie, I want your home. You say, no problem. She says, is your home assumable? You said, it is. But I want $100,000 more than I owe. And Sarah says, no problem. I got a hundred grand right here. Look, it's in my purse. My Louis Vuitton purse is right here. hundred dollar bills. You say, okay, good. Let's talk to my lender. My lender will allow me to do this. They said, yes. Sarah says, no problem. Here's your hundred hundred dollar bills. You can have the Louis Vuitton purse. I don't like that one anyways. So now you have $103,000 in your hand, right? Here's the problem. Sarah's not a veteran. Leslie takes her family her Louis Vuitton and her $100,000, Sarah has Leslie's loan. Leslie's entitlement is tied up 
It is kept with the loan. Sarah has Leslie's entitlement tied up, okay? Now, let's say Sarah loses her job as a doctor. The country says, we don't need doctors anymore. We have chat GPT, we'll fix everything. She loses her job as a doctor. The house goes into foreclosure. Leslie will forever lose her entitlement portion until that is paid back because of Sarah's default, okay? That is worst case, but that is possible. That is feasible. Now, Sarah's a veteran, Leslie's a veteran. They make the different money, the exchange, everything else, and they have a request with the servicer. You have to request this. I need to transfer the entitlement. They look, they say, Sarah's got free entitlement. No problem. They get a guarantee from the VA. They switch the entitlement. Sarah's entitlement is used up. Leslie's entitlement is free now. If you're doing a VA assumption, please look at your veteran, look at their family, look at your service member, look at their family, and realize that if you do not get them to switch the entitlement over, you could be making that family homeless in the future. It is a priority to make sure that that happens, okay? Because the last thing we want Leslie to do is pack up the kids, pack up the home, go to buy a home. She picks up the phone, calls me and says, Alex, you're the greatest lender in the world. I love you to death. I need you to finance my home. By the way, all those things are true. And I say you can't because that home you're trying to buy, you have entitlement tied up on 123 Main Street. She says, what do you mean I can't? I sold that home to Sarah. No, no, it's tied up. We have to know these things and here's why. Our buyers and our sellers agents trust in us to make the right decision. They trust that we provide to them enough information for them to make an educated decision when they enter into the largest transaction that they will ever enter into in their life for most people, most people, right? If we do not tell them the ins and outs, the ups and downs, that falls back on you. As an educator, as a real estate agent, as a partner, it falls back on you. We have to accept responsibility because we should have known enough to know that that entitlement's tied up. Now, how could that end up? I don't know. You might be able to get sued. You might not. But I don't think I could sleep well at night if I knew Leslie's family was sleeping on the streets because I screwed up. That commission check's been spent, but the conscience will always exist. Okay? So remember those things. When we deal with the people that have served our country, we have to do so at the highest level. And I know you're thinking, Alex, you told me that we're going to come here. We're going to talk about the resiliency. We're going to talk about all these great things about veterans. We are. But these are some of the things that we also have to talk about because it is an avenue where somebody that needs to PCS, which is a permanent change of station, meaning that they're active duty and they're going to a different location, right? Or maybe they just want to move somewhere else. Why? Because it's much prettier in Hawaii than it is in Nashville. Whatever the case may be, we have to know these things because an assumption is a real conversation that we're having because the internet and TV and everybody else has educated these people that they exist. Two years ago, did you ever hear the word assumption? I did because I'm in the industry. I did because I'm an educator in the industry. But two years ago, the word assumption was a foreign word. You might as well have made it a word in German and then translated it to the English language within the past two years. Okay, it exists. That being said, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to the debt income or residual income calculation. So VA takes an account for your real world expenses, okay? Any other loan product, you can come to me and Vanessa can say, I am the CEO of a moving company and I make $200,000 a year and I wanna buy a house. What do I qualify for? And I take the interest rate and the term and the purchase price and do whatever my calculator does because I can't do it in my head, but it does it really well. And it spits out a payment. And then I look at her income and I say, hey, no problem. You qualify this divided by this equals that. And you fall in this threshold. FHA is anything below 55%. Conventional is anything below 50%, right? With approved eligible findings. VA is different. And here's why. They're going to look at the income. And then they're, they're going to say, Vanessa, do you have kids? She's going to say, yes, I have two, two young kids. Do they go to daycare? They do. How much do you pay a month in daycare? $1,000 a piece. Boom. There's $2,000 we have to dock her with. And how big is the house? It's 3,000 square feet. Now we take the home and multiply by 14 cents to get a maintenance cost that is calculated in the residual income calculation. Does this sound hard yet? It is. If you make me write this on a bar napkin, it's going to be difficult. Okay. 
My system does it. Thank God for computers. I could imagine doing this in the typewriter days. But that being said, it's taking a real world calculation on the total debts that are going out to calculate whether or not Vanessa and her family can qualify for this loan. Here's the cool thing. Ask me what the VA max DTI is, and I will never be able to tell you. Never. Because I've had clients that qualify at 72% DTI, and I've had clients that could not get a home at a 42% DTI. Why? The residual income calculation is king. If you go one penny over the residual income calculation, Vanessa, you're taking your kids out of school, your husband's going to stay home and watch them because we got to get rid of that $2,000 in monthly debt, right? Or something different has to change. The VA has zero tolerance for going over the VA residual calculation. They do not care about DTI because there are compensating factors, meaning that if Vanessa's husband also has income and there's a car that is his car and we can utilize his residual to offset that, suddenly her residual goes down. Now they qualify, even without him not being on the line. So the resiliency, as you see in the rate changes, when we're doing this, I had a guy call me this morning, actually a buddy of mine. He said, Alex, what's your rate today? I said, well, mine is 2.75, but that's my rate. Your rate is gonna be somewhere in the sevens. And he said that, so if I go find a house tomorrow, it's gonna be in the sevens. I said, probably not, because tomorrow could be eight, could be six, I don't know. Nobody knows where the rate market's going. By the way, there are programs to date right now that you can get a first time home buyer a 6% interest rate, that's a veteran, okay? So bear that in mind. Think about this, you got a conventional buyer, 7.5% interest rate, I don't wanna buy that home, why not? Because I can't afford it. Americans are payment buyers. If you don't think for one second that Americans aren't payment buyers, go into a car dealership and watch the transactions that take place. What do they do? You walk in, hey, you like that Cadillac Escalade? I do, she's beautiful, how much? 100,000, oh, I could never buy a $100,000 car, really? We'll do it for 1350 a month. Oh, really? Yeah. And actually, if we stretch it out for 84 months, we'll do it for $1,100 a month. Boom. You got an Escalade owner. Why? The payment met the expectation. And so in the market where rates are changing, the payment is not meeting expectation. I know each of you have seen the stories of buyers walking out on these million dollar purchase homes. Why do you think that is? Because they look and they say, million dollars, no problem. I can buy that. And then they see that $10,000 a month payment. And they're like, whoa, can't buy that. And so they back out. The nice thing is, is if you're a first time home buyer buying a home less than $400,000, you can get into a 6% interest rate if you've served this country, right? So you've served this country, now your rate's much lower. What does that make it? That makes the payment more consumable. Now you can afford that payment. So as the resiliency in the market changes and your conventional buyers are, are stepping back, your veteran buyers are still buying. Your active duty service members are still buying. Why? Because they have to go to Fort Campbell. They don't have a choice. I know Tanya Roberts is on here. Tanya's up in, in Clarksville. Her husband's a, an officer in the Army. Hopefully I'm not giving out too much data. But when they move, they're not going to rent. They're going to buy. Why? That's what responsible people do. They buy a home. Not saying if you don't own a home, you're irresponsible, but that's that's the American dream. They're taking their piece of the pie. That being said, they're going to buy. And you know what else they're going to do? Let me tell you this, and this steps into the next phase, loyalty. Your veterans and your service members are the most loyal client you will ever meet. It is embedded in them. They are taught by the military to be loyal to the people to the left and the people to the right of them. Why? Because that is how they're programmed. That is how they trust people when they put them on a battlefield and say, okay, this is real, you're going to get shot at. Who do you trust? These people. Do you not think that returns with them when they come back to the U.S.? And so you have people. I've got people I haven't talked to for three, four years. They call me up. They're like, what's up, bro? And I've got their numbers saved in my phone. And I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on? Hey, man, I need to refinance. Okay. They saved my number for several years and asked to refinance. Do you not think for one second that they have a great experience with you? that they're not going to return people to you. They're your most loyal client, I promise. They're not going to come back to you. They are your most loyal client, I promise. And they're not going to do multiple deals with you. Again, they are your most loyal client, I promise. You don't have to be in Clarksville to do that, by the way. The majority of veterans who purchase homes purchase a home 
in the place they used to live. Why? Because they joined the Marine Corps. They go off to Paris Island. They go to boot camp. Then the Marine Corps says, we're sending you to Camp Pendleton. They go to Camp Pendleton. Then they say, just kidding, you're going to Camp Lejeune. They send them to Camp Lejeune. Then they say, ha ha, you're going to Okinawa. You go to Okinawa. And then they say, hey, you're done here. Do you want to re-enlist? And they say, heck no, I can't walk. I can't sleep. Send me home. And so they send them back home. And they walk into Spring Hill, Tennessee, and they look around. And they say, hey, uh, Tanya, what are you up to? Oh, nothing. I'm married. I got two kids now. Oh, I'm still single. I just got out of the Marine Corps. We have nothing in common anymore. Hey, Bill, you want to go have a beer? No, I can't. I've got baseball practice tonight. Right? You have all these things that have changed. They're back home. And they have the ability to kind of do what some of the other people have done, which is buy homes. By the way, I do think that we should we should teach active duty service members how to acquire properties as they progress through the military to create wealth, right? Three fives that maybe they're not married, maybe they are, go buy a little house. Let's teach these people, hey, go buy this little duplex. Get your buddies to live in the left-hand side. You live in the right-hand side. You fix up the right-hand side. The left-hand side pays your total mortgage. Have we thought about that with VA buyers? What about marketing that? What about marketing the ability you got, you got a person that's an E5. They're looking for a place to live. And you go out and say, hey, have you ever wanted to create wealth? What we call in this industry mortgage mules. Mortgage mules, right? The people that pay your mortgage every month. Well, you take your BAH and throw it in the bank to create wealth so you can buy one, you buy your next property. Why are we not speaking that message? You know what message we're talking? We're talking the message of high rates. That's the worst message we can share with people. Interest rates are going to do what they do. In fact, interest rates in my market, in my head, are normal. Because these are what rates were doing when I got into the industry 18 years ago. I know I don't look a day over 25, but 18 years ago when I got in the industry, everyone's laughing. You hurt my feelings when you laugh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But when I got in the industry, this was normal. And normal stayed normal for a very long time. So if we preach to people that interest rates are high, how long are they going to wait? How much more expensive are homes getting? Why would we not suggest to a service member, buy a home, buy a condo, buy a duplex, buy a anything. Get some of your buddies to come in, help make the payment, build some equity, build some wealth, right? These are all things that your veteran and your active service member can do that a lot of people can. Now I made mention, for one, I'm gonna respect your time, but for two, some live questions. And I know a lot of you have probably heard some myths. And some of those myths may include, your seller's gonna let net less money. Says who? Who did you hear for, for that from? Because whoever you've heard that from lied to you. You've heard VA appraisals are harder. Well, if following regulation is harder, then you're right. Because VA has the same parameters of every other loan product out there as far as the parameters they are married to when they look at a property and determine a value. I want you to remember that an appraisal is an opinion, opinion of value. So Leslie's opinion could be different from Sarah's, which could be different from Vanessa's. But at the end of the day, there's market data that they're basing it off of. The difference is, is this, a conventional appraiser can see a gaping hole in the ceiling and turn their back to the gaping hole and take the picture this way so you never see it. That's called deception. So a VA home loan appraisal is not harder. They're just not a lot allowed to lie or stretch the truth or take a picture of the same window twice because the other window has chipped paint. Trust me, in the 18 years that I've been doing this, if you think I haven't seen some really, really shady stuff take place on appraisal, you'll be wrong. I have worked in offices where literal, literal conversations over the phone, you hear someone say, just Photoshop a shingle on there. And all of a sudden the shingles aren't a problem. VA appraisals are not harder. There's also a VA renovation loan that exists. You don't find the perfect home, there's a couple little issues, cool, let's fix it up. Let's make it nicer. Let's make it to the way we want it to be. It's like a foreign language, right? 203K, which is also a renovation loan. Home Ready Home Possible, also renovation loans. We don't talk about those. Why? 
Well, they're harder on the loan officer. Heaven forbid you make me do my job in a day. I like all the easy deals, right? I don't, I don't care. Let's just get deals done. But there's all those other opportunities. And ours, minimum property requirements. Listen, here's what I want you to do. You walk in a home, you look up the ceiling, you see water leaking from the ceiling. Is that a problem? Yeah. For what loan type? Probably every single one except an investor flip. Because your conventional buyer has to fix it. Your FHA buyer has to fix it. Your VA buyer has to fix it. It's a problem. Okay. So we take note. We write that down. We say, Alex, hey, is, is water leaking out of the ceiling? Is that a problem? I say, ha, 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 you're joking, right? Yeah, it's a problem. Now, let's say something a little bit different, like a crack in the window. Does it present danger, a hazard? See, VA is after soundness, sanitary, right? They're looking at those things and safety, soundness, sanitary, safety. Is that oil on the floor or is it dog pee? Is that missing a rail and my drunk buddy could fall off of it to his death 72 inches down into a mulch bed on a rose bush? Maybe, probably should have what we call handrails. Is the floor sloping in the middle so much so that your kids can take their octagons and spin them and they battle in the middle of the living room? Yep, probably a problem with the structural foundation. Vanessa's laughing because she knows what octagons are. I know what octagons are because I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And the fights that occur Octagon is a real term because it's like the octagon, right? Just UFC licensed that, license that already. But my kids will literally fight and start throwing money out and betting on them. I'm kidding about that. But what I'm not kidding about is what they look for. Just walk in the house, look around. Hey, um, everything looks good. But I have a question about this. You take a picture, you send it to your loan partner. Do you think this will be a problem? They should be able to answer yes or no. Okay. Use your loan partner as a person that you can get the information from. If you cannot reciprocate conversation back and forth with your loan par partner, find a different one. If your loan partner takes VA loans and flips them to conventional FHA, USDA loans, fire that person, please. There's a question that says, how about the septic tank and well? So let's answer those two separate. Septic tank, if there is an issue that the appraiser notes on the septic itself, the appraiser must note that. There's no inspection required for a septic. But if the appraiser comes out and he's like, man, I don't know what this stuff is that's lifting up the grass, but the septic tank's right there. I would like further inspection on it. Boom, we got to do an inspection. I promise you, whatever's lifting the grass is not good, okay? If the appraiser makes note of that, the well, here's why we switch it to something different. You are required 100% of the time to have a well test done. You go out there, you crank on the water, you say, where's this water coming from? And they say, oh, we got a well. Guarantee, you have to, have to, have to get a well test done. Here's how it's done. Third party, non-interested, has to collect the sample. Has to collect the sample from the source. There could be filtration systems in the middle. They come to the faucet, they turn it on, they fill up the little beacon, they put a cap on it, they label it. They send it to testing. Where do they send it to testing to? The local municipality. They have parameters. And you're going to ask me the next question, and what are those parameters? I don't know. I don't know. Because it's whatever the county sets. The parameters of Flint, Michigan, are much different than Nashville, Tennessee. I promise you that. One's been on the news, one hasn't. Okay, But if there is no parameter sent by the local municipality, it goes based off the minimum EPA standards. You have to get that report back. You will not, will not, will not close a VA home loan without having that well test done. And please, please, please make sure, even if you are the seller's agent, that your buyer's agent is vividly aware of the fact they have to do a well test. If not, you will be the person responsible to tell your seller they're not closing on time. I read a post earlier today on Real Estate Mastermind. I don't know if you're in that group, but if you, if you like comedy shows and things like that, it's a great group to go into. Go in that group. And there was a person in there. They said, my client signed this paperwork and did all this. And come to find out the refrigerator that was supposed to be in there, that was negotiated in the first contract, in the amendment, they removed the refrigerator. Now my client's had a $3,500 refrigerator. And I said, it is your fault. 
You should buy a $3,500 refrigerator because your client signed a document without your review. You failed your client. That is a tough pill to swallow if that's your pill to swallow. But I promise it's a $3,500 lesson you will never, ever, ever make again. Flood zone. Yes, no problem. AE flood zone, you have to carry the coverage, okay? FEMA dictates the coverage for that flood zone. As long as you have the coverage, you're good to go. No issues there. Um, I'll throw another one out there. What about double wides? Can you do double wides in VA? The answer is yes. What about barn dominiums? Yes. What about um, homes that look like they're not homes? I had a buddy of mine, his name's Alan Jackson, not the real Alan Jackson. And he had a home that was 3,000 square feet. But when you drove up to a home, you're like, golly, is that a muffler shop? There's three big bays. If you're standing in his home, his home is just as nice as the rest of ours. The really cool thing is his garage looks a lot like I would like my garage to look. He's got lifts and everything else, and it's all one structure. It was built as a home. Okay. And so VA looks at it and says, is there comparables? There is. Awesome. Then we can use that. And that is a residential unit. Okay. Also, your comps, large acreage. Who has ever had a client that says, I'm a veteran. I don't like people. I want a 1,200 square foot house and 40 acres. And people's first response is, well, I think they're capped at 10 acres. Wrong. I think they're capped at five. Wrong again. There's no cap on acreage. As long as we can get comps. Find the 40 acres for your client. You know what they want? They want a place to shoot guns, ride four-wheelers, drive Jeeps, drink beer, get lost, get kidnapped by their friends. Like, that's what they want. Find them the property. There's no cap. Okay, any other questions? I'm gonna say this, and, and I wanna say this because of this. And if you have questions, go ahead and type them and I'll address them. If there's a client out there, and I'm, I'm never gonna tell you to put a client before another client. If you have a client that comes up and offers you 550, no inspection, no appraisal, excellent credit, they're gonna pay you cash. You have a veteran client that's offering you 450, Take the client that's going to benefit your client. But if you have two in the same fight, do not let myths that are not true impact your decision on whether or not that veteran should get their home. In fact, a lot of people look at the VA home loan and see 100% financing. And this will make you guys throw up, but if you're going to throw up, don't do it on camera. They see 100% financing and they say, oh, they don't have any skin in the game. No skin in the game. They've been to war, some of them. They're part of a machine that reprograms them, all of them. They have missed time with their families. I know somebody in this group, their husband was gone while their child was born. How are you gonna replace that? How is that not skin in the game when you have that type of sacrifice, right? That's, that's why they get 100% financing. That's why they don't have to put money down. They've already put their money down. And so if all things are equal, give these people a fighting chance, okay? Any other questions? I actually do have a question. I got answers. Um, okay. When you were talking about um, the VA lo loans being assumable and the example of like another veteran assuming that VA loan and freeing up basically their buying ability, is that only able, like, is that only possible for them to, not free up their I can't think of the term sorry but does that only happen if a not non-veteran tries to assume the loan so the so, only way for it to really be safe is veteran to veteran that's correct because even in loans so you have a loan called a joint loan let me venture down this path real quick and I will round about answer your question you have a VA loan called a joint loan okay and this is where um two people are not married okay they're not married and one's a veteran, one's not a veteran. And the VA looks at it and says, well, he or she served this country. They earned their entitlement. You are Bill from accounting. Nobody knows who Bill is. You didn't serve your country. You must make up for the 12.5% difference. The VA entitlement guarantee is 25% of the loan. Okay. And so they say, Bill from accounting, you know how to do numbers. 12.5% of the total guarantee is your responsibility. It's a 12.5% down payment. If you do a Veteran, non-veteran joint loan. By the way, the veteran, non-veteran joint loan has to go to VA for final approval every single time, 100% of the time, okay? 
And so if you take somebody that is a non-veteran that is going to assume 100% of the financial responsibility on a home that is guaranteed by the VA, that has to stay to somebody and it's the person they guaranteed, okay? So you're assuming their entitlement. Now, the exception to that, again, is a veteran. Veteran comes in, free entitlement, yes, sir. Okay, good. You can transfer this over because now they have someone else that has earned the benefit that is at risk of losing that if the loan does not perform, okay? So, and, and mind you, that 25% guarantee guarantees the lender against loss. If I told you guys, each of you are going to lend $100,000, find it, $100,000. And by the way, if you start getting paid back and you receive anything less than what I guarantee back, I will pay you the difference. Are you going to be likely to, to lend that money? You have a guarantee that you're going to get that money back up to 25%, right? If the loan doesn't perform, you get repaid. What are you likely to do as a lender? I would suggest take more risk. If every investment property I've ever bought allowed me a 25% tolerance on risk, I don't I don't know how many properties I'd have. There'd be a bunch. That's what the VA loan's doing. Okay. Does that help answer your question, Sarah? Okay. What other questions do we have? How about this? Let me toss this into the equation. I got a client of mine. He's buying a $5 million home. And he's using his VA home loan. And he is financing 100% of that loan. He is buying a $5 million home, financing 100% of the home. And his interest rate is better than most people's interest rate. In fact, when I did his first home in Franklin Preserve at 1.8 million, we got him a 2.99 rate. He was ecstatic. This was during COVID when his business was kind of hurting. And he had $250,000 that he was putting on the line for the said the lender. I'm like, bro, what are you doing? He's like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I said, you're buying this home. He said, my lender said I couldn't. The Navy Blue Water Act that came out in uh, January 1 of 2000, what are we in now? 23, so 2019 or 18, allows an individual, as long as they have full entitlement available to them, to not have a cap on the amount of home that they can finance. Guess what? I know we think this. A lot of people think, well, what veteran can afford a million dollar home? Any of them. Any of them that have the will and the drive to leave the service and do the things that are necessary in order to be successful. Right? That's all they got to do. I have several clients, by the way, that have million plus dollar homes, VA home loans, and they're blown away. Don't forget that's a possibility. Always do me a favor. Do myself and yourself a favor and the service member. Look at people and say, hey, are you or your wife or spouse a veteran because i'll tell you this if they went to a different company to get pre-approved before they came to you there's a high likelihood that question was never asked i had a client i closed last year in his 70s i asked him that question he's like yeah i was in vietnam i'm like whoa you never use your va home loan he's like no i didn't i didn't know that i could i'm like you never ever ever used it he said no no, no i didn't know i could he used his first VA home loan in his 70s. The man was in one of the worst wars America's ever seen. And nobody ever asked him the question. Those multiple, multiple homes throughout the year, nobody ever asked him the question. He was ecstatic when he found out he could. Okay. Um, elaborate on the 203K, another type of VA loan you mentioned. So the other type of VA loan I mentioned is a renovation loan. So the, VA, the 203K is an FHA product that is renovation. Then you have the Home Ready, Home Possible, pro or I'm sorry, um, not Home Ready, Home Possible, Home Style Renovation Loan, which is a conventional aspect of the renovation loan. And then you have a VA renovation loan. Every single one of them is a little different. And here's why. Because it's different on what investors will allow. That's more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But the fact of the matter is there is a limit to how much money they will allow a person to borrow. Now, here's the thing. It has to add value to the property itself. You can't go in a house and say, okay, we're going to do this renovation loan. And uh, I think we're going to paint the walls. And we're I don't like quartz that is black and gray or white and gray. I like quartz that's green and blue. And so we're going to switch out the quartz. So we're replacing quartz with quartz. Okay. And we're going to take the, uh, the light fixtures. And instead of bronze, we're going to do gold because gold's in, right? I don't, I can't tell you how many kitchens I've seen with gold. Um, anyways. 
So all these little things that are just cosmetic things are not adding to the value. But if you went in there and said, hey, do you notice that the floor's got a little bit of a dip to it? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, we have some structural issues. Can we do those? Only under certain circumstances. Okay. The 203K will not allow for structural renovations. Okay. Only certain circumstances, the VA element will allow for renovations of that sort. Now, oh, we had a squatter here. He kicked through the walls. They tore out the, the handrails. Um, the windows on the front need replaced. Those things add value. The VA renovation loan is perfect for that. Or how about the home? We've all seen this. Cash only. Conventional only. Why? Do you not know about this product? Why doesn't it say conventional unless 203K or other renovation loan is accessible? Let's be better together. From here moving forward, please add that verbiage. If you walk in a home, you're like, oh, this is a shithole. Cash, conventional, or renovation loan only. One other thing, and I'm glad somebody went to that because it triggered my mind to remember this. Has anybody ever heard of a, a, a condo not being approved? In fact, you go, you go on these sites and they're like, uh, conventional only, not approved condo. And it really blows their mind when my educated, my people, right? You guys are my people. When my people say, hey, my lender said that this one's eligible VA. And then the seller's agent wants to argue with you sometimes, right? Like they knew. And then we provide to them the document from VA that says it is approved VA because VA has to approve it once. And that approval sticks. VA also has what's called a spot approval, meaning that you may have a condo that we just need that one approved. And they look at the books and they say, okay, cool, no problem, approved. But it is not approved conventional. It is not approved FHA because FHA and VA are two separate entities. I have had many, many properties that were not approved condos FHA that were approved VA. Okay. So when your client wants to see a condo or when you see a condo that says, not FHA approved slash not VA approved. There's a high probability the person that wrote that verbiage in there did not know those two differences. It's not their fault. They just didn't know. Send me the condo. I'll tell you if it's approved. And I jump into WebLGY, which is VA's portal, and it takes me like 37 seconds to type in the information and boom. And I screenshot and I send it back. Now we have a deal. We have a deal of that veteran that wants to get that home in downtown Nashville because it's been their dream to live five feet off Broadway so they can hear music all night, okay? Those are things we can do, the flexibility. VA has gray areas. VA handbook does not tell you what you cannot do. It tells you the things you can do. It doesn't say, you cannot park navy blue cars here. It says, don't park blue cars. Well, what shade of blue? I don't know. What shade do you not want parked here? There's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of make sense. It is one of the most flexible programs. In fact, the statement was made by an old director that said, as long as an underwriter can document why they made the decision that they made on a VA home loan, we will honor it, as long as it makes sense. Okay. We went a little over time. Any other questions? Awesome. Listen, Amber has gathered a list of everybody that's in here. I will text you individually. I need your address so I can send you a really cool branded Stanley Cup. Again, the reason why I want to send that to you is because I want you to look at that and always remember this class. And you remember this class and you remember the fact that we need to do this for our veterans because they didn't wake up one morning in 103 degree weather, 12 hour, 18 hour time difference from their family, thousands of miles away and say, you know what? I'm not putting my boots on for Leslie today. Screw her. I don't feel like going to work and defending this country. They never said that. They never did that. And the ones I did, they're they're in prison right now. So they don't qualify for the loan anyway. So benefit. But I'm saying for the most part, they have not done that. Okay. And so because of that, we owe them our fighting chance. The job we do is that easy. We need to start doing what we can. Again, all things alike, we need to start doing what we can to make sure that our service members are getting the service they deserve. Okay. The last or two more things. You want to work with more veteran and active duty service member clients? For one, I would ask you why. Make sure your why is the right reason. If, you're, if your initial why is because I can get a paycheck off of them, you're not my people. You're not our people. 
if your why is because I feel like I, I owe it to these people to help them, then you do. And if you start getting involved, so the end of the month, I'm going to Texas for a Texas Valor event. The Texas Valor event helps veterans who have suffered from TBI, traumatic brain injuries. And it's a fundraiser to gather more money to send people on scholarships, okay? And so because of that, I, by the way, I don't benefit, I don't, I'm not licensed in Texas or anything, but my commitment is to serve the veterans. And so find it in your heart to do similar things, whether it's going down and serving food to veterans, saying thank you to veterans, doing something on Veterans Day, whatever it may be, go out there and make it a part of who you are. Because when you internalize the message, the message becomes, you have this particular activating system in your brain, it suddenly becomes vividly aware of how many people that you now know that are veterans that you could be helping. The most loyal people you ever meet. Okay. Thanks everybody for their time. I appreciate you. Again, you will get a copy of this video. Give it a little bit of time. We'll break down the notes. We will upload it. I will get your cups out to you. I have no assistant in my office for the next two days, so they probably won't go out till next week. I couldn't tell you how to get to the post office, even though I see it outside my window, but I will get you your cups, I promise. And thanks again for your time. Have a good afternoon.